Father, dear Father in heaven, glory and honor be unto thy name. Thank you again for this day and uh, this hour. Lord, that you may hold uh, the skies and uh, weather that, Lord, we may be able to learn together as uh, we go through these teachings. Father, may your presence be with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Welcome once again, and uh, I, I say welcome once again, and uh, I solicit your prayers that um, the weather may be okay, so that uh, we may be able to learn uh, uh, together. And uh, today, and uh, in this uh, presentation, I'm going to speak about an appeal to Common Sense Part 11. Hazards of some foods, replacement, and classification. This is number 23 in the series, The Prophets and Messengers. And so uh, one of the things that uh, have made uh, the health message not be acceptable is the way it has been really presented to the people. And instead of being a, a health reform, it has tended towards being a health deformation or uh, a platform to criticize, ridicule each other, both those who have reformed and both and uh, those who have not. And so it, it has caused really uh, a strain. It has caused uh, a friction amongst those uh, who are of the same faith while others seeing they are better than the others and uh, thinking that they can be a criterion to the other. But uh, I want to start on this high point, an appeal to common sense. This is um, the series that uh, we are really running. Uh, and uh, we have had these issues even at marriage levels where people say that, uh, you know, my wife has not... Uh, uh, reformed in this and uh, I just feel that uh, I have to divorce her or my husband has come not come up to health reform or any other reform educational lines and all that stuff and so I don't think I can stay with him I don't think I can stay with her but this is an appeal to common sense and uh, I don't want to put words in people's mouth I don't want it to seem that I'm suggesting anything, but let us read what uh, inspiration has for us. The family not bound with rigid rules, letter 127, the year 1904. E.G. White herself says, I eat the most simple food prepared in the most simple way. For months, my principal diet has been vermicelli and canned tomatoes cooked together. These I eat with the zwempak, then I have also stewed fruit of some kind and sometimes lemon pie. Dried corn cooked with milk or a little cream is another dish that I sometimes use. But the other members of my family do not eat the same things that I do. I do not hold myself up as a criterion for them. I leave each one to follow his own ideas as to what is best for him. I burned no one's else conscience by my own. One person cannot be a criterion for another in the matter of eating. It is impossible to make one rule for all to follow. There are those in my family who are very fond of beans, while to me beans are poison. But butter is never placed on my table. But if the members of my family choose to use a little butter away from the table, they are at liberty to do so. Our table is set twice a day. But if there are those who desire something to eat in the evening, there is no rule that forbids them from getting it. No one complains or goes from our table dissatisfied. A variety of food that is simple, wholesome, and palatable is always provided. Now, this is the message of the Lord, and this is how she used to live in her family. But um, sometimes we go into more than is necessary and uh, create unnecessary dissensions where actually people are forced to eat things although they are helpful but to their system they are not palatable or they are not digestible she says that beans are good and we encourage everyone to get uh, to, to take beans but um, to her beans is poison and to others they cannot digest beans although this is a helpful meal so she says that no one should be a criterion to the other this family rigidness is not what God has called us into. This is an appeal to common sense. 
the hazardous uh, of food and it is um, uh, replacement. Again, um, she says, uh, I like to extreme in diet, extremes in diet. Many of the views held by Seventh-day Adventists differ widely from those held by the world in general. Those who advocate an unpopular truth should, above all others, seek to be consistent in their own life. They should not try to see how different they can be from others, but how near they can come to those whom they wish to influence, that they may help them to the positions they themselves so highly prize. Such a course will commend the truth they hold. And so this is uh, the advice that she is giving that uh, we we should not be a people who their work is uh, readily to condemn readily to condemn and uh, not give people a chance to come to the positions that we hold but we should give them uh, a chance and so uh she continues to say that uh, those who are advocates advocating a reform in diet should, by the provision they make for their own table, present the advantages of hygiene in the best light. They should so ex exemplify its principles as to command it to the judgment of candid minds. There is a large class who will reject any reform movement, however reasonable, if it lays a restriction upon the appetite. They consult taste instead of prison and the laws of health. By this class, all who leave the beaten track of custom and advocate reform will be opposed and accounted radical. Let them pursue ever so consistent a course. But no one should permit opposition or ridicule to turn him from the work of reform or cause him to lightly regard it. He who is imbued with the spirit which actuated Daniel will not be narrow or consated, but he will be firm and decided in standing for the right. In all his associations, whether with his brethren or with others, he will not swerve from principle, while at the same time he will not fail to manifest a noble Christ-like patience. Christ-like patience. Noble Christ-like patience. When those who advocate hygienic reform carry the matter to extremes, people are not to blame if they become disgusted. Too often our religious faith is thus brought into disrepute. Uh, and... Uh, in many cases, those who witness such exhibitions of uh, inconsistency can never afterward be brought to think that there is anything good in the reform. Anything good in the reform. Why? These extremes do more harm in a few months than they can and do in a lifetime. They are engaged in a work which Satan loves to see go on. Because we, from principle, discard the use of those things which irritate the stomach and destroy health, the idea should never be given that it is of a little consequence what we eat. I do not recommend an unimproved diet. Many who need the benefits of healthful living and from conscious, conscientious motives adopt what they believe to be such are deceived by supposing that a meager bill of fare prepared without painstaking and consisting mostly of marshes and so-called gems, heaven sodden, is what is meant by a reformed diet. Some use milk and large amount of sugar on mash, thinking that they are carrying out health reform. Think about that. Sugar on a mash. But the sugar and milk combined are liable to cause from fermentation in the stomach and are thus harmful. The free use of sugar in any form tends to clog the system and is not unfrequently a cause of disease. Something they must eat only just such an amount and just such a quality and confine themselves to two or three kinds of foods. But in eating too small an amount and that not of the best quality, they do not receive sufficient nourishment. There is real common sense in health reform. Think about an appeal to common sense. This, this is what we are looking at. Health hazard, hazard and uh, food um, um, replacements. There is a real common sense in health reform. People cannot eat, people cannot all eat the same thing. Some articles of food that are wholesome and palatable to one person may be hurtful to another. Some cannot use milk while others can subsist upon it. For some, dried beans and peas are wholesome while others cannot digest them. Some stomachs have become so sensitive that they cannot make use of the coarser kind of graham flour. 
So it is impossible to make an unvarying rule by which to regulate everyone's dietetic habits. Narrow ideas and uh, overstraining of small points have been a great injury to the cause of hygiene. There may be such an effort at uh, economy in the preparation of food that instead of a healthful diet, it becomes a pov poverty stricken diet. What is the result? Poverty of the blood. I have seen several cases of disease most re difficult to cure, which were due to impo impo impoverished diet. The persons thus afflicted were not compelled by poverty to adopt a uh, Amiga diet, but did so in order to follow out their own erroneous ideas of what constitutes health reform. Day after day, meal after meal, the same articles of food were prepared without variation until dyspepsia, uh, dyspepsia and general debil debility resulted. Many who adopt the health reform complain that it does not agree with them, but after sitting at their tables, I come to the conclusion that it is not the health reform that is at fault, but the poorly prepared food. I appeal to men and women to whom God has given intelligence, learn how to cook. I make no mistake when I say men, for they, as well as women, need to understand the simple healthful preparation of food. Their business often takes them where they cannot obtain wholesome food. They may be called to remain days and even weeks in families that are entirely ignorant of in this respect. Then, if they have the knowledge, they can use it to good purpose. Um, Investigate your habits of diet, study from cause to effect, but do not bear false witness against health reform by ignorantly pursuing a cause which militates against it. Do not neglect or abuse the body and thus unfit it to render to God that service which is his undue. To my certain knowledge, some of the most useful workers in our cause have died through such a neglect. To care for the body by providing for it food which is relishable and strengthening is one of the first duties of the householder. Better by far have less expensive clothing and furniture than to scream the supply of necessary art costs um, for the table. Most people enjoy better health while eating two meals a day than three. Others under the existing circumstances may require something to eat at supper time. But this meal should be very light. Let no one think himself a criterion for all that everyone must do exactly as he does. Never cheat the stomach out of that which health demands and never abuse it by placing upon it a load which it should not bear. Cultivate self-control. Restrain appetite. Keep it under the control of prison. Do not feel it necessary to load down your table with unhealthful food when you have visitors. The health of your family and the influence upon your children should be considered as well as the habits and tastes of your guests. Health reform means something to us and we must not belittle it by our views and practices. We must be true to our convictions of right. Daniel was blessed because he was steadfast in doing what he knew to be right. And we shall be blessed if we seek to honor God with full purpose of heart. And so this is the issue of uh, criterion. How do we present this message? So that uh, the message itself is palatable before even the meals themselves become palatable. There is a way the messages have been presented that they are more injurious and uh, the people think that when they get to the meals also, the meals will be injurious as the message itself has been injurious. And so no one should assume criterion for other and start poking uh, at others when they feel that something has not been done the way it should be done. This is not to say that uh, we should not get hold firm of uh, the health principles and hold them as to what the Bible says and uh, what um, through the messengers it has been revealed unto us. And uh, just uh, another quick statement from uh, Minister of Healing. Minister of Healing, page 319, paragraph 2, MH 319.2. This is where I was coming in the extremes in diet. The chapter is chapter 25 of uh, Ministry of Healing. Ministry of Healing, chapter 25. Um, we have a reading here. 
Not all who profess to believe in dietetic reform are really reformers. With many persons, the reform consists merely in discarding certain unwholesome foods. Uh, they do not understand clearly the principles of health and their tables still loaded with harmful dainties are far from being an example of Christian temperance and moderation. Another class in their desire to set a right example go to the opposite extreme. Some are unable to obtain the most desirable foods and instead of using such a things as would best supply the lack, they adopt an impoverished diet. Their food does not supply the elements needed to make good blood. Their health suffers, their usefulness is impaired, and their example tells against rather than in favor of reform in diet. Others think that since health requires a simple diet, there is need to be little care in the selection or the preparation of food. Some restrict themselves to a very meager diet, not having sufficient variety to supply the needs of the system, and they suffer in consequence. Those who have but a partial understanding of the principles of reform are often the most rigid, not only in carrying out their views themselves, but in urging them on their families and their neighbors. The effect of their mistaken reforms are seen in their own ill health, and their efforts to, port, to force their views upon others give many a false idea of dietetic reform and lead them to reject it altogether. Those who understand the laws of health and who are governed by principle will shun the extremes both indulge, both of indulgence and of restriction. Their diet is chosen not for the mere gratification of appetite, but for the upbuilding of the body. They seek to preserve every power in the best condition for highest service to God and man. The appetite is under the control of reason and conscience, and they are rewarded with health of body and mind, while they do not urge their views offensively upon others. Look at this. While they do not urge their views offensively upon others, the example is a testimony in favor of the right principles. These persons have a wide influence for good. Praise the Lord. There is a uh, real common sense in dietetic reform. The subject should be studied up broadly and deeply and no one should criticize others because their practice is not in all things in harmony with his own. It is impossible to make an unvarying rule to regulate everyone's habits and no one should think himself a criterion for all. Not all can eat the same things. Food that are palatable and wholesome to one person may be distaste, distasteful and even harmful to another. Some cannot use milk while others thrive on it. Some persons cannot digest peas and beans. Others find them wholesome. For some, the coarser grain preparations are good food, while others cannot use them. Those who live in new countries or in poverty-stricken districts where fruits and nuts are scarce should not be urged to exclude milk and eggs from their diet. Hi, you, you can hear some sound in the background apostasy. Time and place of these statements should be considered when uh, giving these messages. Who was the audience? What kind of background did they have? What did they have in their vicinity? What could they get in even a distance? And what could they not get? But we take a quote and apply to everyone in every island and in every existing place. But look, she says, those who live in a new in new countries or in poverty-stricken districts where fruits and nuts are scarce should not be able to exclude milk and eggs from their diet. It is true that persons in full flesh and in whom the animal passions are strong need to avoid the use of stimulating foods. Especially in families of children who are given to sensual habits, eggs should not be used. But in the case of persons whose blood-making organs are feeble, especially if other foods to supply the needed elements cannot be obtained, milk and eggs should not be wholly discarded. Great care should be taken, however, to obtain meat from healthy cows and eggs from healthy foals that are well-fed and well-cared for, and the eggs should be so cooked as to be most easily digested. Amen. Amen to that. Uh, and remember she's talking, there is knee, there is real, there is real common sense in dietetic reforms. And that is why we are talking about an appeal to common sense. Now, in the next paragraph, she says, the diet reform should be progressive. As disease in animals increases, the use of milk and eggs will become more and more unsafe. 
An effort should be made to supply their place with other things that are healthful and inexpensive. The people everywhere should be taught how to cook without milk and eggs so far as possible and yet have their food wholesome and uh, pal palatable. All should learn what to eat and how to cook it. Men as well women need to understand the simple healthful preparation of food. Their business often calls them where they cannot obtain wholesome food. Then if they have a knowledge of cookery, they can use it to good purpose. Now, the narrow ideas of some would be health reformers have been a great injury to the cause of hygiene. Hygienists should remember that dietetic reform will be judged to a great degree by the provision they make to their tables. And instead of taking a course that will bring discredit upon it, they should so exemplify its principles as to command them to candid minds. There is a large class who will oppose any reform movement, however reasonable, if it places a restriction on their appetite. They consult taste instead of reason of the loss of health. By this class, all who leave the beaten track of custom and advocate reform will be accounted radical, no matter how consistent their cause. That these persons may have no ground for criticism, hygienists should not try to see how different they can be from others, but should come as near to them as possible without the sacrifice of principle. And uh, we read this in the earlier quote, that uh, we should practice Christ-like spirit and true moderation. And so we are not called to fight. By the way, force is the last resort of every false religion. And God is not calling us to force people into things. If uh, the religion of Christ was to force people into things, then Christ could have come here ere long because he could have just forced everyone to be a Christian once. And then he comes. But uh, then uh, um, Christian matters should be approached in a Christ-like spirit so that everyone is presented with a reason of the hope they have, the faith of the hope that they have. And they should make uh, an informed decision rather than say that I was deceived into this. And when there are eventualities to be faced, we be accountable for what actually we did not mean to do, but because we presented it in a bad way, uh, it uh, left an impression upon the hearts of the people that was not good or it was misunderstood. And the way it went to be carried on, it was not in the best way. And so when it comes to matters of health, identifying the problem is not sufficient, but providing a solution is the best thing. You know what we are always used to is you brother, you sister, this thing that you are doing, soon you will die. This thing that you are doing, you will soon be like this. This thing you are doing, soon you will have diabetic. This thing you are doing, soon blood pressure. And, you know, even if a person didn't have a blood pressure and hypertension, the moment you start on that track, brother, soon you will be this, soon you will be this, soon you will be this, the people start having heart failures. And then... You say, you see, my prophecy was fulfilled. Now you are diabetic. Now you have high blood pressure. Now you have this and you have this. No, even the person may not have been sick. But just because of the way you pointed fingers at them, they, uh, the, the, the body itself gave way. And uh, because maybe they could have been suffering from something small, it just, the system just broke down and uh, it became weak. Not because this person was practicing unhealthful living but because the message was so strong it was not a redemptive message but it was a message to cause the heart to fail now you know when the heart fails the whole system fails and you know what i mean by that um and so our work the work of the teachers the work of medical missionaries the work of dietetics the work of hygienists it is not to identify the problem, but to provide a solution. Always pointing at the problem will never bring people to the state that the Lord wants them to be. It is good to know our condition so that we may apply the right solution. But then you can stand from the point of solution where actually Christ, even in Genesis 3.15, provides a remedy for sin. The counsel of peace sat before anything else, and so sin found when there was remedy. 
And so we should be telling people, you know, you don't have diabetes. But uh, in any case, you come across somebody that has this and this. This is the solution. So the person will learn a solution for a problem before even a problem is there. And then they can be able to apply the solution before the problem. Here is a guideline of the hazards of some foods replacement and classification that uh, we need uh, really to take care of us. Now, quoting from uh, Herbert Douglas, the message of the Lord, talking about the message of Lord, the Lord, page 320, uh, we are told concerning yeast, jam in bread, Ellen White pen that bread should be thoroughly baked that so far as possible, the yeast jam shall be destroyed. She was scoffed at for this moment, even as late as 1940s. For years, popular magazine advocated eating a cake of live yeast daily. We now know that live yeast cells take up B vitamins from the food material in the intestine, thus making them unavailable for the body. Butter is less harmful when eaten on cold bread than when used in cooking. When properly prepared, olives like nuts supply the place of butter and flesh meats. And so uh, I'd like to bring something on the screen just about these replacements and uh, we share together. I may be going so fast and so maybe reading together, it will help us a little bit. What is bad about butter? Two basic problems. This is Messenger, the Messenger of the Lord, a book written by Herbert Douglas uh, uh, um, and uh, proving that E.G. White was inspired. So what is bad about butter? Two basic problems, disease and health factors relating to fat and cholesterol in the diet. Regarding disease, in the late 1800s, butter was often rancid, a mixture of casein and water or of calcium, gypsum, gelatin fat, uh, and so unmashed potatoes. Referring to the future, Ellen White wrote, tell them that time will soon come when there will be no safety in using eggs, milk, cream, or butter because disease in animals is increasing. Apart from the danger of disease, butter is almost pure fat. It has many of the long-chain saturated fatty acids that tend to increase serum cholesterol, as well as short-chain fatty acids which do not cause the problem. One tablespoon of butter contains 30 through mill, 33 milligrams of saturated fats and cholesterol. And so, the American Heart Association stated in May 13, 1994, because butter is rich in both saturated fat and cholesterol, it is potentially a highly atherogenic food, causing hardening of the arteries. Most margarine is made from vegetable fat and provides no dietary cholesterol. The more liquid in the margarine, i.e. tub or liquid forms, the less hydrogenated it is and the less trans fatty acid it contains. Therefore, though still high in fat, margarine is a preferable substitute for butter and soft margarines are better than hard ones. Dietary fiber, Ellen White warned that fine flour bread cannot impart to the system the nourishment that you will find in the unbolted wheat bread. The common use of bolted wheat bread can not keep the system in a healthy condition. And so she's talking about the bad things and giving the good things, the bad and good, giving the good things. The body needs two major types of fiber in the diet. You see, the solution is being given. Not only fingers are being pointed at the people, but she is saying what is proven medically wrong and scientifically wrong, but also giving a solution to what is right. The body needs two major types of fiber in the diet. Soluble fiber helps to lower serum cholesterol and uh, triglyceride levels. The best sources are oats, beans. The best sources for what? Fiber. Oats, beans, apples, or what people call apples, barley, and buckwheat. Thus, these foods help reduce the risk of a heart attack uh, because... Um, there's not much cholesterol in these things. And you know that a lot of cholesterol actually clogs the heart. A lot of cholesterol will clog the heart. And so the best sources are oat beans, apples, barley, and buckwheat. Thus, these foods help reduce the risk of heart attack. Insoluble fiber can be found in wheat bran, which reduces the risk of colon cancer. Foods high in fiber help reduce the risk of uh, carcinogenic agents in the intestines. And we know carcinogenic carcinogenic agents are the agents that cause cancer. People may say 
B9. But um, what is wrong with the benign, benign cancers? You will find that uh, these are maybe uh, growths that uh, are not um, dangerous, but nonetheless, sometimes it needs that those growth be inhibited, be cut off, and this will start causing uh, scars on the body. At the end of the day, we'll find that there are places which are weak from uh, cutting off these body parts, although even they are benign. You find that uh, you are having a swelling that is benign. It's not cancerous. Uh, and um, the more you have many of them, even though they are not cancerous, but uh, you will now just get starting started worrying about how you get these parts of the body. And in the end, actually, although they are not cancerous, they, it proves that um, they'll be not good. And so um, we are told insoluble fiber can be found in wheat bran, which reduces the risk of colon cancer. Foods high in fiber help to reduce the risk of carcinogenic agents in the, mat in the intestines. The fiber attaches to the cholesterol and bile acid that have been secreted by the gallbladder and moves them in from them from the intestinal tract rapidly. Animal products have little or no fiber. Refined grains and other refined products have very little because those uh, outer uh, coats have been moved and uh, those are the things that really, uh, really uh, um, um, constitute uh, or um, add to the fiber. In Adventist Healthy Study, 16 men who often ate whole wheat bread had only 56% of the expected non fatal heart attack rate and 89% of the expected fatal heart attack rate. Again, in an Adventist Health Study, 16 men who often ate whole wheat bread had only 56% of the expected non-fatal heart attack rate and 89% of the expected fatal heart attack rate. Numerous recent studies relate the risk of colon cancer to the lack of fiber in the diet. Gastrointestinal transit um, time is 77 hours when on a re refined diet, but 35 hours on a refined diet. Populations on a refined diet have a higher incidence of colon cancer than in countries where most are on a refined diet. Colon cancer risks decreases as the fiber in the diet increases. Experts such as Dr. D.P. Bucket world known British surgeon and medical researcher said that a lack of dietary fiber is a major cause of appendicitis, appendicitis, or appendicitis, appendices. Uh, varicose vein, and um, we read that um, it's a major cause of uh, append appendicitis, varicose veins, diverticulosis, colon cancer, uh, hiatal uh, heinous, constipation, and other health uh, problems. On uh, flesh foods, in 1866, Ellen White wrote that the liability to take disease is increased tenfold by meat eating. Further, in 1869, she said that meat should not be placed before our children. Why was she explicit about this issue of meat? Because the practice of meat eating is detrimental to physical, mental, and spiritual health. Physical impact. Ellen White wrote that meat eating increases the liability to disease tenfold. Further, it causes obesity, certain de sudden death, heart attack, or stroke, unwholesome condition of bones, probably osteoporosis, and cancer. Contrary to conventional thinking, she called it a mistake to suppose that muscular strength depends on the use of animal food. The needs of the system can be better supplied and more vigorous health can be enjoyed without it is used. Without it is used. In addition, the use of the flesh animals tends to cause gross, grossness, obesity of the body. Now, <laughs> we have ever heard this statement that um, if you want to be a bull, eat what the bull eats. It's incredible. You know, sometimes when I hear that statement, it doesn't appeal to common sense. You can't eat what the bull eats. I know how good that statement means. But let us not be fanatics in these things. That um, if you want to be like a bull, eat what the bull eats. The, the, the stomach of a bull is not your stomach. So 
you know some people will take these statements literally and go ahead and eat things that cannot be eaten and so uh and uh the way the bull eats is not the way you eat the bull can eat cozy foods without uh, 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 uh softening them human beings cannot do that the cozy foods have to be softened to be eaten they are not like uh these uh, soft edible foods uh like cozy vegetables they have to be done something if it is just steamed they have to be steamed or cooked thoroughly the the the, the soft vegetables can be steamed but the cozy vegetables have to be cooked uh, i i think thoroughly if i'm not wrong and so I know when we make the statement, if you want to be a bull, eat what a bull eats, it's a good statement. But actually, if taken literally, it is injurious. It is this such extremes and um, lack of wise, uh, wise making of these statements that uh, cause the people who are uh, sensitive to say, these people are brainwashed. So let us be careful with the statements we utter when we are on the pulpit and uh, not cause a reproach to the message. Now, mental impact uh, on uh, certain kinds of food, uh, Ellen White cautioned that students will accomplish much more in their studies if they never tasted meat. When the animal part of the human agent is strengthened by meat eating, the intellectual powers diminish uh, proportionately in that. Uh, uh, the reason actually she talks about this meeting is that um, it benumbs the mind and uh, the digestion process goes for a longer time and why does the digestion process go for a longer time, even the way the meat should be used? Because uh, it's cooked. When you look at the Bible, uh, very carefully, it says that uh, your meat, you shall remove all fats and uh, all blood. Now, you attempt to do that to any meat and uh, see what it turns into. It will be something that... Uh, it won't taste at all. And uh, I know if you do that, the digestion process is, uh, uh, the time is uh, short. But many people will never do that while preparing their meat because the sweetness of the meat is in the blood and the fat that are in it. And that is what the people enjoy in meat. There is nothing that people enjoy in meat actually, apart from that blood and uh, apart uh, from uh, those fats. Remove all of them, serve somebody and they'll never taste it. And so uh, the process of making it and putting it on the table really uh, doesn't uh, go well with the digestive system. It takes a longer time. And uh, when food takes a longer time in digesting, putrefaction uh, happens so fast. And more so, the people who do brain work, actually the mental uh, work, actually, they, they, they don't move a lot. All they have to do is think. And so, you know, a lot of movements facilitates also uh, a, a quicker digestion and uh, the release of excessive cholesterol in the body by sweating and all that stuff. But a person who's just doing mental work and it is thinking and thinking, actually meat will never be the best thing for them. Never, never, never. Even without EG white, it is just simple as that. Meat will never be good for people who do mental work because of the digestion process and the time that it takes. Uh, and as we read earlier that uh, it should be progressive. And uh, while we say that uh, health reform should be progressive, it doesn't mean you will take forever progressing. You can get forever. You can spend forever learning new things. and new, But it doesn't mean you will take forever transiting from meat eating. Like you say, okay, she has said that uh, the reform should be progressive. So I'm giving myself 10 years to progress from eating meat. Brothers and sisters, that is a dangerous thing to think that she was talking about. Again, Ellen White spoke directly to church leaders regarding meat eating. No one should be a teacher of the people who by 
teaching or example contradicts the principles of health reform. Physicians who use flesh meat and prescribe it for their patients should not be employed in our institutions. Ministers who eat meat set an evil example and make it difficult for others to have confidence in them. And uh, I want to be careful that statement she talks about uh, um, those who those ministers who refuse to uh, implement health reform should not be paid by tax. Those who refuse health reform and politics should not be paid from uh, tithe money. And so that is a serious thing to consider about it, that uh, the free eating of meat and advocating it to people should make you be released of your duty as a pastor. And uh, aware of some dangers of too many nuts in the diet because of their high fat content, she warned that too large a quantity of nut food is an injury, but all can eat freely of fruit. You, I, I like the wisdom of E.G. White. When she says this is bad, she gives a substitute. When she says large, um, many nuts in the diet is bad because of its fat content, she says that substitute it with what? With fruit. Eat of large quantity of fruit freely without worrying what will happen to you. And uh, in the Adventist health study, when men who ate nuts four, five times a week had only half as many fatal heart attacks as those who really ate nuts. 80 walnuts and almonds have been shown to lower serum lipids, reducing risk of uh, atherosclerosis. On fruits and vegetables, uh, in just recent research have focused on the health benefits of a diet rich in vegetables and uh, fruits. Vegetables and fruits are complex foods containing more than 100 beneficial vitamins, minerals, fiber, and other substances. Scientists do not yet know which of the nutrients or other substances in fruits and vegetables may be protective against cancer. But uh, many studies are now coming up. The principal possibilities include specific vitamins and minerals fiber, minerals fiber and uh, phytochemical um, in these um, uh, vegetables and the fruits. And uh, we are being told that uh, the planned, the planned based diet is the best that uh, you can implement for such a time as this. And uh, until more is known about specific food components, the best advice to eat five or more servings of fruit and vegetables each day. Now, the Adventist Health Study also indicated that vegetarians consume twice as much vitamin A and four times as much as vitamin C as people in the general population. The antioxidant vitamin A and C and E may lower the risk of cancer and coronary heart disease. Eating four servings of legumes per week decreases risk of pancreatic cancer much more than eating legumes only once a week. Now, I'd like to read something from uh, Herbert Douglas on where does one find these antioxidants. And... Uh, she is much more, again, quoting E.G. White on these things, proving that she is a messenger of the Lord. He says in his book, The Messenger of the Lord, page 324 to 325. And uh, I'll read. Um, where does one find these antioxidants? In carrots, squash, tomatoes, leafy vegetables, and dried fruits, fresh strawberries, melons, broccoli, Cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, it, it is. In a study of elderly people, high consumers of these foods had only 30% of the cancer mortality as that of low consumers. In 1996, American Cancer Society's report, reference was made to the oxygen-induced damage to tissues that occurs constantly as a result of normal metabolism. Because such a damage is associated with increased cancer risk, antioxidant nutrients are thought to protect against cancer. And what are they? Where do we found these antioxidants? In carrots, squash, tomatoes, leafy vegetables, dried fruits, fresh strawberries, melons, broccoli, cauliflower, and Brussels sprouts. Antioxidant nutrients include vitamin C, where actually we know much of fruit will give you that. And um, 
vitamin E, psyllium, and uh, carotenoids. Studies suggest that people who eat more fruits and vegetables containing these antioxidants have a lower risk for cancer. Message of Light, page 324 to 325, quoting E.G. White on these things. Those eating cabbage once a week had only one third the risk of colon cancer compared to those who ate it once a month. Those getting adequate vitamin A had only one third the risk of lung cancer compared to those with low intake of vitamin A. Oral and pharyngeal cancer were reduced by half in those consuming high quantities of fruits and vegetables. Adequate amounts of uh, the antioxidant vitamin A, C, and E have been shown to reduce the risk of ca cataracts. Uh, that is um, eye problems. Those who consumed fewer than 3.5 servings of fruit or vegetables daily had a 5 to 10 times increased risk of cataracts. And, uh, you know, in this um, age where actually there are I wanted to make this point, and uh, it's not a funny point. We are living in the point of uh, the church, which is in Laodicean condition. You know, Laodicean condition, it has an eye problem. They are blind. Now, it is so bad that we become blind spiritually, and also we become blind physically. We have cataracts physically. And we have cataracts spiritually. We have cataracts spiritually for not taking a wholesome food of the Bible. We have cataracts physically for not taking a wholesome food physically. You see how these things are related. And so what happens in the natural also is in the spiritual. What the, the natural things will teach us about spiritual things. Lack of wholesome food physically will give you physical cataracts, blind eyes. Lack of good food spiritually will bring you blindness, the Odyssean condition. And so we can learn from the natural to the spiritual. And so let us be careful about that. And so that is a point I wanted to make. And uh, we are told that um, those who consume fewer than 3.5 servings of fruit or vegetables daily had a 5 to 10 times increased risk of cataracts. Food high in potassium like oranges, bananas, potatoes, and milk reduce risk of stroke by as much as 40%. And uh, what are we learning today? We are looking at um, an appeal to common sense, part 11, hazards of some foods, replacement, and classification. This is number 23 in the series, The Prophets and uh, Messengers. And so uh, it is common sense to look at these things and uh, decide for what is best for the body. On fruits and vegetables at the same meal, Ellen White counseled that we should avoid eating vegetables and fruit at the same meal. At one meal, use bread and fruit. At the next, bread and vegetables. And this is in the list of classification now that uh, vegetables and fruits should not be used. And uh, you understand much of the fruits are uh, their digestive enzymes are different from the vegetables. And um, even their, their digestive period, very different from vegetables. And so uh, you shouldn't be mixing things that uh, will be antagonistic to each other when it comes to digestion and digestive enzymes that um, others are likely to cause a lot of uh, acidity. Fruits may be changing the vegetables into uh, uh, more acid and then uh, you, you start having acid uh, uh, reflux and Sometimes even people go as far as having heart burns when these things are mixed in the wrong way. What are the problems when fruit and vegetables are combined? For many with a feeble digestion, the mix will cause distress and inability to put forth mental effort. Some children become fretful and 
TVs. Ellen White saw in vision the cause of a minister's sickness. I took notice of your diet. You eat too great a variety of one meal. Fruit and vegetables taken at one meal produce acidity of the stomach, then impurity of the blood results, and the mind is not clear because the digestion is imperfect. You can read that in uh, Message of Light, page 325 to 300 and 325.9 and 0.10. Now, is there anything wrong with alcohol? Um, is there anything wrong with alcohol? L let us read this and uh, see. Alcohol, alcohol, alcohol. Now, with alcohol, let me see if I can put on the board a statement. Mm. Those who who are under alcohol see things they should not. Uh, Uh, th th this is in uh, Proverbs 23, Proverbs 23, verse 31. Let, let us look at this. When we talk about is alcohol good or is alcohol bad, we tend, one of the verses that uh, we have to look at is Proverbs chapter 29. Now, I'll read uh, from uh, verse 29, Proverbs 23, Proverbs 23, Proverbs 23, just give me a moment and I'll be there. Proverbs, Proverbs 23 from verse 29, okay, this one is here on the board. It says, who hath woe, who hath sorrow, who hath contentions, who hath bubblings, who hath wounds without cause, who hath redness of eyes? These are the questions that are asked by the wise man. And uh, what are some of the answers he will give? Who has all these things mentioned in verse 29? They that tarry long at the wine, they that go to seek, to seek mixed wine. And you know alcohol is mixed things look not thou upon the wine when it is red when it giveth his his color in the cup when it moveth itself aright at the last it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder thine eyes shall behold strange things this is what i was saying and thy eyes shall behold strange women and thine heart shall utter perverse things those who are under the influence of alcohol alcohol is not good you don't need a doctor. The Bible has said that is what it is. You will behold strange things, strange women, and your heart shall utter perverse things. And uh, without joking, uh, there was a man who was uh, drunk and uh, just beside the river and was told, you know, let us take you to the house you sleep. He said, no, I'm in my mansion. Those are not laughable things. You, you hear such a thing and your heart just goes to the children of this man and the wife. If a person can be lying beside the road and you tell them, let us take you to the home to bed, and he says, I'm in my mansion, you understand this is a perverse thing. And uh, it is lamentable. And we are told in ministry healing that the person who gives alcohol to anyone, that one who has deprived children of their fathers and mothers will stand a worse judgment a worse judgment when judgment is made in heaven and uh, she says that uh, when it comes to this issue of health temperance and voting even if it were on sabbath go cast your vote against intemperance if the government says that we want votes to ban this and this and the the country is going to hold uh, a vote against this be sure that that is one of your christian duties of Isaiah 58 to go cast your vote on sabbath against that 
This is not breaking of the Sabbath, but loving your neighbor as you love yourself, which is part of the commandments. And while executing one commandment, that is it. And so, alcohol is bad. We were looking at what about alcohol. So you shall see pervert, you shall behold strange women, and thine heart shall utter perverse things. Verse 34 says, Yeah, thou shalt be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea, or as he that lieth upon the top of a mast. Now, th those, those, those are strong words uh, to think of. And what is a must? A must is a, a tall, upright post. And so think about somebody lying on such a thing. And uh, she says that, uh, You shall say, They have stricken me, thou shalt say, and I was not sick. They have beaten me, and I felt it not. When shall I awake? I'll seek it yet again. This is a person who is drunk. So what is wrong with alcohol? Just what we have read. And that, that can be sufficient. Alcohol affects brain cells. When Ellen White wrote in 1885 that alcohol beverages destroy reason and life, and in 1905 that such a drinking destroys the sensitive nerves of the brain, she sounded like an overzealous temperance orator. But in 1970, research indicated that even the moderate in Biber may incur some loss of irreplaceable brain cells every time he drinks. The only real difference between his loss of brain tissue and that of the heavy drinker is one of, of degree. The ability to make decisions concerning moral issues begins to slip at very low alcohol intake levels, much below what is considered adequate to lower heart attack risk. And that is what we have read. You shall see strange women and you shall utter perverse things. You shall say that they have beaten me and I. this did not happen. Caffeine affects spirituality. Ellen White may not have known that... Uh, she was many decades ahead of scientific confirmation when she warned that all such as stimulants and narcotic, narcotics as tea, coffee, tobacco, alcohol, and morphine exert a pernicious influence upon moral character. The earlier these hurtful habits are formed, the more firmly will they hold their victim in slavery to last, and the more certainly will they lower the standard of spirituality. But this truth is reflected in current studies. Researchers, among other findings, note that as coffee drinkers grow older, their coffee consumption increases. On a spiritual plane, this increase in consumption accompanies a decrease in religious involvement. Again, faulty diet and poor scholarship. In 1884, Ellen White stated that nine-tenths of the wickedness among the children of today is caused by intemperance in eating and drinking. Six years later, she wrote that if the diet materially affects the mind and disposition. Today, widespread evidence indicates that um, there is a correlation between poor diet habits and poor scholarship. Better fed children get better grades in school. When students with poor grades and poor diets are given nutritionally enriched meals, their grades and other scholastic, in, scholast, scholarly, scholast, scholastic indicators improve. Now, she, she talks about uh, children being introduced to alcohol at a very early stage. And uh, there's here uh, a statement in the Ministry of Healing, which um, she talks about children being introduced to uh, alcohol in a very early stage. In uh, Ministry of Healing, page 339, she talks about this habit that the parents should avoid. To create liquor appetite in little children, Alcohol is introduced into confectionery. Such a confectionery is sold in, in the shops. And by the gift of these candies, the liquor seller entices children into resource. Day by day, month by month, year by year, the work goes on. Fathers and husbands and brothers, they, they stay and hope and pride of the nation are steadily passing into liquor dealers' hands to be sent back wrecked and uh, wrecked or ruined. And so we should be very careful in uh, giving these children candies and all uh, these things that uh, we are giving them. These things affect the mind. And then uh, the children cannot subsist without them. You find that the children are so um, addicted to some things because these things were introduced as alcohols. And you know, when the blood is addicted to something, 
uh, it is so hard, so hard, it's so hard to really work on it. And so uh, my prayer is that uh, we should um, avoid any kind of zeal without knowledge. And uh, we should be doing things in a more redemptive way than uh, in a very condemnatory manner. And so we are not to make a criterion of everyone that um, our classification will be another person's classification, our food will be forced on others and our diets will be uh, forced on others. No, let these things be done under the spirit of Christ. There is those who take the letter of the law and they deny the spirit out of it. And uh, the only thing I can say is this, is that um, God has called us for education. The light that shineth in the darkness has brought light to everyone who is born in this world. And that light is to continue shining day by day and increasing. The Lord does not give us things in floodlight, but as we can take them. If we give the people as they can take it, the work will be easier than flooding them with uh, the things that are. Uh, you know, we give information until people say, is there anything that I'm left with? Nothing at all. And then they say, if this is the way it's going to be, that everything is taken away like this, then I just better remain the, the place I am and uh, let God have mass on me. But if we shall present the message the way it should be presented, the people will see some sense in what we are doing and step by step, they'll climb the ladder. And by beholding Jesus Christ, we are turned from glory to glory. And may the Lord bless us. Shall we pray? Father, again, we thank you because uh, you are a merciful God. In the days of ignorance, thou winged at us, but no more when light comes to us. We lack wisdom in many things, Lord, and uh, we who are teachers, we are told that we shall be judged harshly because we stray a lot. And instead of uh, moving or wooing people closer to thee, we drive them away. Help us, Lord, where we have error. And there are many who have died because... Uh, we talked some things and they did take measures which were not right, Lord. And as, as it seems that their blood is upon us, have mass upon us. There are others who have left the faith completely because of the statements that have been uttered on the pulpit. May also have mass on us. Where restitution can be done, Lord, so may it be. Give us the strength. Other things that we have purpose to utter which are not uh, according to thy will and thy wisdom, Lord. May you erase them on our minds or uh, correct them before we utter them. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.